Hare Ramo, 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 Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and Krishna, Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Jaya Prabhupada, Prabhupada Jaya, Prabhupada Jaya, Prabhupada Jaya, Prabhupada Jaya, Prabhupada Jaya, Prabhupada Jaya, Prabhupada Jaya Om Vishnu Bhad Paramahamsa Parvajagacharya Atto Tarasata Shri Shri Mad Divine Grace A.C. Bhakti Vedanta Sambhi Prabhupada Ki Ananta Koti Vaishnam Rinda Ki Grantarad Shri Mad Bhagavad Gita Ki Sambhita Bhakti Rinda Ki Gaur Premanand All Glories to the Sambhita Devotees All Glories to the Sambhita Devotees all glories to the assembled devotees. All glories to Sri Sri Guru and Sri Goranga. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Magyana Timirandasya Gananjana Shalakaya Chakshur Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurve Namaha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupaka Damayam Dadati Swapadantika Vandehang Shri Guru Shri Yuta Pada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavam Cha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raghunatan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvetam Savadhunam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakan Vitamscha He Krishna Karuna Sindo Dina Bando Jagatpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namos Tute Tapta Kanchana Gorangi Radhe Rindavan Eshvari Rishabhanu Sute Devi Pranamami Hari Priya Vancha Kalpa Tarubhyascha Kripa Sindhubhya Evacha Patitanam Pavanebhyo Vaishnavebhyo Namo Namaha Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaur Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Okay. So, um, we do a, how does it go from here? We do a kirtan or how, I've forgotten how the format works. Everybody's muted, I guess. Um, Mara, so the, 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 the chanting that you just did is, um, the, that's, that's as far as we go with the kirtan. Oh, typically okay. so you could just jump right into the class and then um you know questions and answers you can take them as you like 
during the class or at the end, and then we wrap it up um, Eastern time. Uh, the class should usually closes at seven, and then and then we chant for maybe uh, a kirtan of about the same length that you just did. Oh, okay. Okay. So, um, as I understand it, we're doing two dot sixty two. Is that the verse for today? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So Sasha confirms. All right. So um, let's go to the verse itself. Um, this is 262. I'm going to do 262 and 263 because they're a pair. They're usually quoted together. Dhyayato vishyan bhunsa sangas te shupa jayate sanghat sujayate kama kamat krodho vijayate. So this translates while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them, and from such attachment, lust develops. And from lust, anger arises. While contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them. And from such attachment, lust develops. And from lust, anger arises. So here's the purport by Srila Prabhupada. One who is not Krishna conscious is subjected to material desires while contemplating the objects of the senses. The senses require real engagements, and if they are not engaged in transcendental loving service of the Lord, they will certainly seek engagement in the service of materialism. In the material world, everyone, including Lord Shiva and Lord Brahma, to say nothing of other demigods in the heavenly planets, is subjected to the influence of sense objects. And the only method to get out of this puzzle of material existence is to become Krishna conscious. Lord Shiva was deep in meditation, but when Parvati agitated him from sense pleasure, he agreed to the proposal, and as a result, Kartikeya was born. When Haridas Dakur was a young devotee of the Lord, he was similarly allured by the incarnation of Maya Devi. But Haridas easily passed the test because of his unalloyed devotion to Lord Krishna. As illustrated in the above-mentioned verse of Sri Yamuna Acharya, a sincere devotee of the Lord shuns all material sense enjoyment due to his higher taste for spiritual enjoyment in the association of the Lord. That is the secret of success. One who is not, therefore, in Krishna consciousness, however powerful he may be in controlling the senses by artificial repression, is sure to ultimately fail, for the slightest thought of sense pleasure will agitate him to gratify his desires. <clears throat> so here's 263. Krodhad bhavati samoha samohat smriti vibramaha smriti bramshad buddhi nasho buddhi nashat pranasyati. <coughs> From anger, complete delusion arises. From delusion, bewilderment of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. Here's Prabhupada's purport here. Srila Rupa Goswami has given us this direction. Prapanchikataya buddhya hari sambandhi vastunaha mumukshubhi parityago vairagyam palgukatyate and that's from the Bhakti Rasa Mita Sindhu 1.2.256. By development of Krishna consciousness, one can know that everything has its use in the service of the Lord. Those who are without knowledge of Krishna consciousness artificially try to avoid material bond, try to avoid material objects, and as a result, 
although they desire liberation from material bondage, they do not attain to the perfect stage of renunciation. Their so-called renunciation is called pulgu, or less important. On the other hand, a person in Christian consciousness knows how to use everything in the service of the Lord. Therefore, he does not become a victim of material consciousness. For example, an impersonalist becomes a victim. For example, the impersonalist, the Lord, or the absolute. For example, for an impersonalist, the Lord, or the absolute being impersonal, cannot eat. Whereas the impersonalist tries to avoid good eatables, the devotee knows that Krishna is the supreme enjoyer and that he eats all that is offered to him in devotion. So after eating good eatables to the Lord, after offering good eatables to the Lord, the devotee takes the remnants called prasadam. Thus everything becomes spiritualized and there is no danger of downfall. The devotee takes prasadam in Krishna consciousness, whereas the non-devotee rejects it as material. The impersonalist, therefore, cannot enjoy life due to artificial renunciation. And for this reason, a slight agitation of the mind pulls him down again into the pool of material existence. It is said that such a soul, even though rising up to the point of liberation, falls down again due to not having support in devotional service. So I'll reread the Sanskrit of those two verses. Again. Dhyayato vishyan pumsa sangate shu pajayate sangat sangayate kama kamat krodho bijayate krodhad bhavati samoha samohat smriti vibramaha Smriti Brahmshad Bhuri Nasho Bhuri Nashat Pranashiti. While contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them, and from such attachment, lust develops. From lust, anger arises. From anger, complete delusion arises. And from delusion, bewilderment of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. Okay, so uh, this uh, section is from the last part of the um, Bhagavad Gita in the first, I mean, the second chapter. And in general, what we find out here is that this second chapter is about uh, the fact that we're not the body. Basically, that's kind of the main theme of the second chapter of Bhagavad Gita. So um, it has several sections. Uh, I'll go over them here a little bit briefly because we're in the final section now. In uh, verses 1 through 9, Arjuna is hearing from Krishna briefly, and then Arjuna responds immediately to Krishna, who is chastising Arjuna. And then Arjuna gives more reasons why he doubts the idea that the battle should take place. Then from 10 to 30, that's about 20, 21 verses, Krishna explains about not being the body and about the soul and reality. So that's kind of the Sankhya uh, series or the Sankhya section. Then the third section here, Krishna further uh, augments explaining the duty of a Kshatriya. So um, for, further, Krishna's further arguments explaining the duty of a Kshatriya. So um, Krishna explains that... Um, Arjuna is a warrior, it's his duty, and it doesn't matter whether he's dealing with relatives or with anyone else. And if he does so, he will go to the heavenly planets. If he fails to do so, he will be derided uh, by other kshatriyas and it will come to no good here in this earth. So that's 31 through 38, we've been through that. Then Buddha Yoga, 
uh, from 39 through 53. Moody Yoga is just another name for Bhakti Yoga. And that uh, particular section um, is where Krishna describes some more about how one can engage in Krishna consciousness. And finally, we're in this section where Krishna answers Arjuna's four questions. The questions are what are the symptoms of one in transcendence? Arjuna's question was, how does someone like that talk and what is his language? In other words, how does he respond to other people? Then Arjuna asks, how does he sit? In other words, what does he refrain from doing? And how does he act? Meaning, what does he actually do? So now Krishna is answering those questions. And in answering those questions, he comes to this section that we have just talked about, where uh, Krishna describes what I call the pathology of um, the attachment of the sense objects how that gets worse and worse and gradually brings a person to ruination. So in a more uh, narrative form here, Krishna is um, chiding or creating, uh, Krishna is admonishing Arjuna. Then he explain, Arjuna explains his doubts. Then Krishna surrenders. Then Arjuna surrenders, but remains adamant about not fighting. Then Krishna explains the body and the soul, spirit and matter. Then Krishna explains the duty of Akshatri. Krishna explains Buddha Yoga. Arjuna asks four questions, and Krishna answers those four questions. So we're at the last stage of chapter two here. So here are the verses that we are actually discussing and the painting that was done originally by BBT artists to go along with this uh, particular verse, this, these two verses. These two verses, 262 and 263, are usually put together. Oh, here they are. Jayato vishayam pum sam sangas te shu pajayate sangat sanjayate kama <clears throat> kama krodo bijayate. So this verse means while contemplating the objects of the senses, a person develops attachment for them, and from such attachment, lust develops, and from lust, anger arises. So we see these various um, uh, things just depicted here in the painting to the right. You know, here's a man contemplating this lady and they're, they're seeing each other. So there is a uh, kind of uh, attachment forming. And then below that is uh, lust is forming and then now below that we see anger and then we see delusion and we see bewilderment of memory and finally we see complete destruction of the poor living entity who allowed himself to get um, caught up in this uh, lust it's easy to be actually very caught up in lust it's quite common in the material world especially you know, uh, we're talking here about lust in the sense of sexual, because, um, you know, in, uh, as we'll talk about a little bit later on, um, the uh, lust is not just about sex. It can be about anything. One can be lusty for any type of thing. It doesn't necessarily have to be sex. So that's the first part of the verse. And then there is, Krodha bhavati samoha samoha smriti vibramaha smriti bhamsha buddhi nasha buddhi nasha pranasati. From anger, complete delusion arises, and from delusion, bewilderment of memory, and when memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, one falls down again into the material pool. Now, I thought, just for fun here, um, I would roll a PSA, <laughs> public service announcement, um, about 
four or five years ago, I was uh, studying broadcast uh, equipment um, at a location about three blocks away from the Brooklyn Temple called Brick, which they teach you how to run professional cameras and do professional recording equipment and how to, you know, work the uh, different people in the in the camera room, work people in the background, people who rolling the um, you know, uh, teleprompters and people who were doing the audio and all that kind of stuff. So we each had to come up with a, you know, a short one or two minute, three minute PSA. And I chose to do one on the, uh, this, these two verses of Bhagavad Gita. So I'm going to see if this will work. We're going to try to roll it here. Uh, can you hear it? Yeah, we could make it uh, together on uh, Tuesday, I think. Yeah, in the morning. Something. Are oh, you all able to hear? Gotta go. Glad you could make it. <clears throat> A little friendly message from your neighborhood, Bhagavad Gita. While contemplating the objects of the senses. One develops attachment for them. From attachment, lust develops. And from lust, Anger arises. From anger, complete delusion arises. And from delusion, bewilderment of memory. When memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost. And when intelligence is lost, <clears throat> one falls down again into the material pool. Mama, it worth it. But I love the objects and the senses. regular sound again. All right, here we go. Think. All right, do you hear me and see me again? <laughs> yes, Mars. Yes. You, you could hear that or it was... Uh... Yes, it was excellent. I just wondered whether the sound came through or not. It was far from excellent. It was a, the first, <laughs> the first uh, thing that we ever did in uh, to try to produce a, a, an actual program in the uh, Brick uh, studio. So that was my first program there, this little PSA. At any rate, you can see what the idea is, that it's about this uh, idea of contemplating the objects of the senses. So... Let's move on here. Um, we start off with this idea of contemplating. So by contemplation of the object of the senses, one develops attachment. So 
contemplation of the sense objects causes us to become attached to them. This is how advertising works. This is why you see Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola everywhere. Why you see, um, you know, iPhones, iPads everywhere. You see them uh, plastered all over everything. Um, why you see all these various kinds of advertisements for beer and for the Olympics. And, you know, uh, when the advertisers want to uh, get someone to do something or to buy something or to pay for something, then they immediately do a whole big campaign, which is designed to have people think about it. You see and hear and uh, come back to it again and again. And therefore people think I must get this Coca-Cola. I must watch the Olympics. I must, um, you know, buy an iPhone. I've seen it on the television. I've seen it on my computer. I've seen it on billboards. I've seen other people buying it. So therefore contemplation is what gives us the sense of attachment. And so that's the very first stage contemplating. And uh, this group of uh, different stages or phases is a pathology. A pathology is the study of how disease or a dysfunction gradually gets promoted and becomes worse and worse, or how it evolves, or we could say how it devolves. So this pathology of going from one thing to the other is gradually going downhill. So um, we become entrapped by this process and later we become destroyed. And this brings to the foreground a very important point that um, our own mind is our worst enemy. So this is described in, uh, the, in chapter six where we see this first. Bandhur Atmanas Tasya Ye Nat Mai Vatmana Jitaha Anatmanas to Shatru Ve Varte Nat Mai Vashatru Vat. For him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best of friends. But for one who has failed to do so, his mind will remain the greatest enemy. So the mind can be our best friend or the mind can be our worst enemy. What makes it our best friend or what makes it our worst enemy? That Krishna will explain in later chapters of Bhagavad Gita. But uh, to give you a spoiler or a real quick version of what makes the difference, if the mind is, tr is focused upon Krishna and Krishna's service, the mind will actually eventually become our friend. If, however, the mind is not focused on that, but rather focused on material sense gratification or the objects of the senses, then, of course, the mind will be our worst enemy. So it's our best friend, our worst enemy, depending on what we feed it. it used to be a saying, you know, your mind is what you feed it. So if we feed it objects of the senses, we contemplate them, we will ultimately become degraded. If we feed it, uh, trying to focus on Krishna, Krishna's service, Krishna's qualities, characteristics, entourage, etc., our mind will become gradually progressive and we will become uh, lifted out of material consciousness. So we just said from contemplating objects of the senses, attachment develops. Now we go from attachment, lust develops. So continuing attachment will result in lust. The difference between attachment and lust is that lust is uncontrollable. So attachment is there, but attachment when it's uh, amplified and when it becomes out of control, that is lust. So a person wants something, whether it's good for them or not, whether it's good for others or not, whether it's legal or moral or not, none of these things make any difference. So this is the definition of lust, where someone wants something and they want it so much that it 
any kind of um, restraint, any kind of uh, uh, moderation, any kind of, um, you know, uh, rule or um, prohibition. The person who wants that thing, the lusty person who wants that thing, will ignore it and go right on past it. And so, uh, as I said earlier, one can be lusty about things other than sex. And therefore, through devotional service, we reorient the mind away from common objects of attachment and lust. That's, in a nutshell, what Krishna consciousness is. All we are doing as devotees is learning how to re orient the mind away from various material sense objects. If we can reorient the mind away from sense objects, we will become gradually purified and the sense object will have less pull, less gravitation to our consciousness. However, if we don't do that and we instead allow the mind to circle, circle, circle uh, and to uh, dwell on sense gratification, then we'll have further fall down this ladder. We're going from one thing to another. So um, <clears throat> if we stop this progression at any point, we do not degrade to the next stage. So we hear that from contemplation comes attachment, from attachment comes lust, from lust comes anger, from anger comes a bewilderment of memory from bewildering uh, from memory being bewildered uh, one's intelligence one becomes delusional uh, when uh, from uh, rather from uh, anger one becomes delusional when one becomes illusional his memory is bewildered when memory is bewildered intelligence is lost and when intelligence is lost then one becomes completely dysfunctional that's the uh, the nature it starts off simple. It starts off not very offensive. It starts off uh, hardly uh, with any warning signs or symbols at all. But if you continue down the path of uh, this uh, cascade of going from attachment to lust to anger to delusion to bewilderment, each stage is worse than the one before it, and each stage a person is more and more dysfunctional. So uh, from attachment, lust develops. And if we stop it at any stage, then we don't have to go to the next stage. But once you get to the progressive stages, it's very, very hard to stop. It's like a hill and the first, the hill is not so uh, much facing downward. The hill is just a slight incline. But as you gradually walk further and further down the hill, the hill gets steeper and steeper. And as you get toward the bottom of the hill, you're just going to fall. You won't even be walking. You won't even be able to make a, a, a distinction. You won't be able to choose whether you go further down. You'll just fall further down. So that's the nature of this cascade, that by choosing to go further down, it becomes more difficult to turn around and it becomes more painful and more you become more dysfunctional. So this is like a warning, or like we said a minute ago, it's like a PSA, a public service announcement that uh, Krishna is giving Arjuna a public service announcement that if you go down this way, you're going to have a lot of trouble. So from lust, anger arises. So now lust means that we have to have it, whatever it is. We got to, got to, got to have it. So lust is never satisfied. It's selfish and self-serving because when a person is lusty after something, they no longer consider whether it's good for them, whether it's good for the world, whether it's good for the person that they're involved with, they don't consider any of those things. They just know that they want it, they need it, they're going to get it. And so this is why lusty people abuse others. And uh, when somebody wants something bad enough, then uh, they're willing to do whatever it takes to get that thing. So... Uh, that's why we have to be very careful. And we know that at some point, whatever thing we are lusting over, 
that thing will become uh, out of our reach. There's no, no such thing as a guarantee that our lusty source, whatever it is we are sourcing our lust from, you know, whether it's another person, it's sexual, it's something else, it's uh, money or it's power or it's prestige, whatever we are uh, finding as our source that we find uh, pleasure in, that gives us the sa satisfaction of satisfying our lust, at some point, something's going to interfere with it. The supply will dry up or somebody will compete with us for the same thing, or we will find that uh, we are becoming um, unable to purchase it anymore because it costs too much or something like this. And in this way, through starting off with simple lust, now we're in a position where we no longer can have that lust. Uh, that lusty object is out of our reach. And when that happens, we become immediately angry. So anger is the result of unsatisfied lust. It's the result of lust uh, and the person and the object of that lust being uh, separated, that somehow there's an obstacle. Somebody else wants it. Somebody else has it. The faucet gets turned off for some reason. Now we are angry. And when a person has their object of lust uh, blocked, Immediately, there's anger, and that is, as I'm saying here, spontaneous, visceral, and uncontrollable. We automatically, we don't have to think about whether we're going to be angry or not. We are angry. There's no uh, two ways about it. And that anger is destructive and blinding. When people become repetitively, frequently angry, such people have all kinds of issues happening eventually in their lives. Because they're repeatedly angry, they blow people out. They uh, become unwanted in society. They create legal problems for themselves. They create social problems for themselves. They may be married or have a family. They create problems in that marriage, in that family. They create issues right and left. This is the nature of people who become angry very easily. So why does a person become angry very easily? Because they have so much lust and it's not being satisfied. And uh, there is no question that the material world will set itself up to simply just dote on us and give us all of our lusty uh, objects just as long as we want them in the way we want them as much as we want them this never happens the material world just doesn't work like that no matter who you are even if you're a millionaire so uh, the nature of lust is that it will go unsatisfied at some point and when it does the person will become outrageously angry and if that uh, involves somebody else blocking them for reaching their desired lustful object, they will attack that person. If uh, someone is suggesting that they become more moderate in their use of whatever thing they find uh, themselves lustfully attracted to, they will become angry at that advice and they will reject that advice. So it's inevitable that when one gets lustily attached to something, that that something will eventually be pulled away from them. And then immediately we get anger. So from now, anger, delusion arises. Um, what is delusion exactly? So we're finding out <laughs> that people who become uh, repetitively angry on a, a very frequent basis, such people will find that they cannot maintain a stable mentality and they will not be able to understand what's going on around them. Anger kind of um, is a very powerful emotion 
And it causes, you know, the brain to erase all the circuits, you know. When a person gets angry, they forget everything. We've all had this experience. When you get very angry, you forget that you're talking to maybe a teacher or your uh, spouse, or you forget you're talking to a child, or you forget you're talking to uh, someone who is delicate, or you forget that you're talking to someone who could uh, reprimand you or a policeman or anything. You forget all these things. You just want to vent that anger. So all this gets dumped out of the mind because the only thing we want to do is to satisfy that anger by lashing out, by being violent, by at least being verbally aggressive. And when we do that, we burn bridges, we blow people out. Uh, people uh, begin to avoid us. We uh, become undesirable at our workplace. We become uh, the kind of person that people don't want to work with, that people don't want to hire. We, come the, we become the kind of person that no one wants to be married to. We become the kind of person who gradually is incapable of having <clears throat> good relationships. And we generally find ourselves in um, denial of this situation. So we start living in a dream world. We pretend people are the way we want them to be instead of the way they actually are. We pretend either that uh, we are popular or intelligent or witty or we are very, um, you know, attractive when actually most people can't stand us. Uh, we pretend that uh, we are, you know, uh, drinking not that much when actually we're drinking more and more. We pretend we are uh, kind of keeping our smoking within check when actually we are getting more and more involved in it. We pretend that uh, our uh, outbursts of anger are uh, justified instead of being just... Uh, our inability to control ourselves. We think that the person deserved to get the uh, abuse verbally that we gave them. And this is the way that uh, delusion arises. We live in a world that's no longer the real world. We live in a world of what we imagine. And if um, our uh, delusion involves uh, substances like alcohol or drugs or various kinds of um, other such uh, intoxicants, then um, that delusion becomes even more thick because we can't think straight and we never think straight. So this is why as people go down this spiral, as people go down this road to uh, further and further dysfunction, they become more and more entangled and they have less and less of an idea how far gone they are. They just uh, uh, think that everything was the same as it was w when this cycle first started. So that's the problem. So people who are delusional, they live in their own selfish world, and they're blind to reality, and they're blind to the needs of others. They don't care. And even if they do care, they forget about it in the next minute. And they tend to harm themselves and everybody around them because they don't even know what they're doing. They're so out of control. And they make demands and they make uh, more and more demands. And they never consider uh, how others may be in difficulty or in pain by the way that they're being dealt with by this person who is now, you know, delusional. So, of course... The next stage down is from delusion comes a bewilderment of memory. When someone is angry and delusional, they no longer can remember things. They live completely in the moment. And what is that moment? That moment is about what material desire do I want to satisfy right now? Am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Do I want to engage in sex? Do I want something to divert me? Do I want to be entertained? Um, and in this way, a person 
only thinks in terms of 15 minute intervals. They just think, what do I need right now? What am, what's the most important material desire? Is do I need to eat something? Do I need to watch a movie? Do I need to find somebody or approach somebody hoping for some uh, romantic or uh, lustful interlude? Uh, this is the way that uh, uh, a person begins to act. And of course, as we can see, people who have gotten this far down the rabbit hole, who have gone this far down the cascade, now they are very impaired. They are very dysfunctional. They are socially um, incapable for the most part. They may have legal problems at this point. They might have mental problems at this point. They might have substance abuse problems at this point. At this point, they may have uh, uncontrollable emotions that just uh, blow up when something occurs. So at this point, a person is pretty dysfunctional. And most of the time, when we get this far down the rabbit hole, when we get this far down the ca cascade, then we're no longer able to keep any role in society. We are basically dysfunctional. And uh, so when memory is bewildered, intelligence is lost, and one falls, as we say, down the into the material pool. Uh, so we can see, as this little... Uh, illustration tells us that by following this downward path through uh, trying to focus our lives on sense gratification, on sense objects, by focusing on that, we become gradually more and more helpless and dysfunctional, and eventually we become sick, physically sick and mentally deranged. Uh, we cannot participate in society. Um, at that point, a person is kind of beyond their own help. Even if they can see, and mostly they can't see, but even if they do see that they're in serious uh, mental and physical shape, they don't know what to do about it, and they don't have the willpower to do anything about it. And as a result, such a person is, uh, it's necessary for them to get help from outside. Sometimes that help is there, uh, and sometimes not. And that help may actually be uh, used by them or they may reject that help. And generally, whatever help they need is going to be very specialized. They're going to need people who know about psychology. They're going to possibly need some kind of uh, substance abuse withdrawal. They may need some kind of specialized uh, rehab uh, situation. They may need to live in an enclosed environment. They may need people who know how to handle violent people, you know, all this kind of stuff. So this is the nature of how this um, cascade progresses. As we said, it starts off with uh, simple contemplating the object of the senses. Doesn't sound very scary at that point. We're just contemplating the senses. Oh yeah, we like this kind of stuff, so we've got an attachment for it. So this is how it starts, but actually it does not end that way. It, it gets deeper and deeper and it goes farther and farther until a person eventually becomes completely dysfunctional. And this is why sense gratification is the real enemy of everyone. And the cure or the way that we can get free from such uh, issues is by controlling the mind. We're going to learn about that. And, and we control the mind in Krishna consciousness. Instead of focusing on the objects of the senses, because the mind will always want to do that, we now force the mind to try to think about service to Krishna, to try to think about how to do things correctly. We learn to take up various restrictions. These restrictions are what give us life. By having these various restrictions, then we are not uh, destroyed by our own selves, by our own mind. As we said, the mind is the best friend or the worst enemy. So I'm going to uh, uh, open here for any questions or comments that anyone might have before I 
talk about the second part of what I was hoping to uh, discuss, discuss. Any questions or comments? Give everybody a moment to unmute themselves. Hi, Krishna Mahesh. Yeah. Yeah, um, I was so happy when you um, broke down the different elements of this verse, you know, especially when you came to delusion and then bewilderment of memory, because you know, those those items were like blurry for me. But um, I guess they're, they're still a little bit hazy because, you know, I think the further down the cascade we come, it becomes less and less like relatable because, I mean, everybody can, I guess, relate to having... Um, attachment to sense objects and um, lust, you know, but when it comes to like the delusional part and, you know, only <laughs> remembering 15 minutes at a time, you know, uh -huh. you know, I, I mean, I don't know. I think most of us probably just don't have such people in our circles unless you know I'm blind to it or something I don't know I guess well, I it, guess it's just mm, yeah well in New York we see such people all the time <laughs> you know in yeah. in the every day uh you know on the street and I see yeah. them in the subways and you know I I feel my heart goes out, but I, I don't know what to do for such people because uh, there's so many of them. And you can tell that what they all need is a very, very specific and, uh, you know, very structured intervention, that would, what it would be to take to bring them around. And uh, this is how they got there. You know, uh, at one point, these were regular everyday people just like you and I, and they had you know, relationships and jobs and families and all that stuff. And now they're, you know, wandering around in the subway with, um, you know, various kinds of plastic bags over their shoes or all kinds of weird things, you know, sleeping in the train. Um, and there are people who are high functioning versions of this where they may still have a house, they may still be able to do it, but they're just, you know, like uh, some kind of a, um, you know, uh, demon, you know, that no one can relate to them. No one can stand to be with them because they're so out of control. Yeah. And I think that's the thing for me that, you know, it's just maybe because I, I, I haven't seen anybody start from, you know, the top of the rabbit hole and then end up, you know, I haven't been, I haven't, traced anybody's steps down that rabbit hole you know is it's, it's hard to to see how a person can start off with a seemingly benign or innocuous attachment and then end up like talking to themselves on the subway from there you know right right that's that's the nature of our world that uh, this is not visible and that's why people go from, uh, you know, being a normal person at one point to being totally wiped out. Now, the place where it happens the fastest is around gambling casinos. Um, if you ever spend any time in Las Vegas or Reno or any other such place where gambling is quite commonly done, you can see this progression happen literally in the space of one or two years where normally it takes maybe five to 10 years for it to play out, you know, um, because uh, the process of gambling kind of rips a person out of a normal life and puts them into this emotional uh, desperate stage 
where eventually they gamble away everything they have, where uh, they can't relate to other people. All they can think about is uh, trying to get a few dollars together to make that next bet where they're sure they're going to win it all back, you know, uh, which of course will never happen. And uh, at the same time in the gambling casino available to you, there are all the other things like drugs and alcohol and uh, uh, meat and everything else. So you are at the same time degrading yourself just by associating there. So there um, you can watch the downward spiral happen very fast. It's much more accelerated there. And places uh, and cities who have this kind of um, setting where they have gambling casinos there, they have to do special things for city government to be able to um, deal with the, the actual fact on the street that there are so many people who are blown out, you know, and people who just literally uh, months ago may have been professors or um, functioning people in some management chain and some organization. They might have had a normal family. They might have had normal relationships, but now they're just a complete physical and, and mental wreck. They're just, you know, wandering around. But um, we don't see this. It, it happens too slowly. And uh, in this way, we don't understand how a person gets like that. We just see that and we imagine that uh, this person was born like that or, you know, some kind of crazy thing. But a person isn't born like that. A person gradually gives away their control over their lives. And by inches, they become completely out of their own control and they become overwhelmed by various uh, reactions to the progressively darker and ex progressively more extreme forms of uh, sense gratification that a person becomes prone to as they continue. So the only thing that can really stop it is if a person has a connection with the Supreme Lord. It can be in Krishna consciousness or it can be in any other religion. But uh, unless there's some idea that one wants to serve God or some, wants to try to uh, clean themselves up, then uh, there's just a question of how fast and how uh, deep will that uh, progressive downward spiral go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, scary, scary stuff. Um, yeah, right. Thinking about my own life, of course. But anyway, um, yeah, just to um, see if I if I got the qualities of delusion and um, the bewilderment of the bewilderment of memory or loss mm -hmm. of memory. They're the same, right? So delusion and with delusion, um, you start to be, you start to have. You start to have, um, I guess, illusory conceptions of of your behavior towards others, right? Yeah. So, but how did that evolve out of anger? With, well... With, with you're, you're, you're less frustrated, right. you know. How does that? How does yeah? How is that an out, outcropping of that frustration? Well, as I was saying, anger is a very. Um, I think most psychologists are aware of this fact that anger is a very powerful emotion, and it tends to just uh, wipe the the. Uh, the registers clean in the human mind. When you get very angry, you just forget everything. Um, you forget everything and you just want to satisfy that anger by lashing out. You know, I see all the time when I'm walking somewhere, people who are practicing lashing out, you know, <laughs> I, you know, it seems strange and crazy, but I see it all the time. You know, people who are just angrily speaking to no one, there's nobody there. And they're angrily speaking. I don't think, you know, there's no cell phone in their hand. 
uh, but they're just kind of practicing lashing out, you know, so that when the time comes that they need to lash out, they can do so in eloquent form, you know, uh, and uh, it just shows that um, they're completely absorbed in their own immediate needs. And uh, when a person is absorbed in their own immediate needs, there's no long-term anything in that kind of a thing. It's just a moment-to-moment thing. And when you lash out angrily, you know, um, then you become uh, kind of a pariah in society. People avoid you. Um, uh, Across the street from the Brooklyn Temple, there was this anger management uh, facility for the city of New York. And, uh, you know, um, as I mentioned sometimes at uh, 2 a.m. in the morning or something, someone would come out and explain to the universe what was wrong with it (laughs) at the top of their lungs. And, uh, you know, I I could get the chance to understand, you know, what was wrong with the universe, various things that I didn't know. Oftentimes they weren't. um, eloquent enough or or, uh, they weren't articulate enough to, you know, I could understand the details of it, but I could understand that they were angry and frustrated and so on and so forth. So um, people become, you know, physically out of control, especially when they start getting physically violent, you know, then they, then the state has to intercede, the police come and, you know, uh, they take you to that place. Of course, right now that whole building is undergoing a massive renovation. So uh, luckily we don't have any inmates anymore for the anger management, at least until the building gets finished. And then, you know, I'm sure they'll all move in with their, uh, you know, uh, friends and their uh, compatriots who are even more angry than they are. But um, that's the nature of it, that uh, through becoming angry, one forgets any long-term thing And one tends to forget the effect of their anger. They minimize it in their own, in their own minds. And it becomes uh, a kind of um, what we call denial. And then when you deny things, that means you're living in an alternative reality. Um, People are avoiding you, but you're pretending something else is going on. Or you begin to realize people are shunning you and you just, uh, drown your sorrows with, you know, a fifth of whiskey or whatever it is. You just kind of go that route. Um, And uh, in this way, we become more and more um, disconnected from reality. So we're already disconnected from reality when we don't know about Krishna. Then we become even more disconnected from reality when we start imagining that this world is something for our sense gratification. And as that sense gratification gets darker and we become more and more out of it progressively by this downward spiral, then uh, we become less and less even aware of what most people consider reality, even on its most basic and fundamental level, uh, the, you know, basic uh, fundamental um, bottom uh, realities of mundane reality, you know, that, uh, if you are abusive to people, they'll hate you over time and they'll avoid you over time. If you're, uh, violent, somebody's going to come and do something about it sooner or later. If you are, uh, completely uncontrolled, eventually you're going to be on your own. So, uh, you become, you know, blind to all that. It's, uh, it's, Anger does that, and uh, I think psychologists have more or less the same understanding that uh, persons who are unable to control their anger, and they're angry constantly, such people kind of lose track of everything. And and the the main thing that they lose track of, would you say, is their relationships with people, you know, the nature of their... And therefore, um, they will speak in any in any way because they're not remembering that. Okay, you know, this is uh, as you were saying before. You know, this is my boss. I shouldn't speak in this way. Or this is my wife. You know, I shouldn't speak to her that way. Or you know, things like that. You know, is right. The uh, Yeah, you can just, uh, you know, 
when you get to the level of people who live on the street, you can see they have no plans other than, you know, uh, it's going to get uh, cold soon. So I'm going to have to go from sleeping in the park to sleeping in the subway, you know, that, that kind of plan they have. Uh, but um, in general, a person in the mode of passion is thinking, I'm going to increase my income this way. I'm going to move up on the corporate ladder or I'm going to expand my enterprise by adding a, a different kind of uh, product. You know, they have these long range plans and they plan that next summer, me and my wife, they're going to take a trip to X, Y and Z. You know, there are these long range plans, but people who are constantly angry, they've disrupted all their uh, relationships. And they don't have any long range plans other than, you know, um, I'm hungry right now. Uh, I'm bored right now. This person bothers me. You know, I mean, that's the kind of plans they have. Those aren't really plans. You know, those are just reactions to the immediate circumstance that they're in. And um uh, this is how a life turns into a non-life, you know, how we get down the road where a um, person cannot even, uh, you know, uh, function at all. The other day I was here on the third floor and I kept hearing this yelling going on outside, you know, I was another person, you know, uh, uh, but I hadn't heard it for a while because the anger management place is all shut down. So I looked out and uh, there was a man and he was screaming at the top of his lungs and he was moving very in a crazy way. He was right in front of that, uh, you know, um, uh, Marriott or whatever it is it's across the street. And then he started to get down on his hands and knees and he started to kind of like rub himself on the pavement in a very bizarre way. And uh, so I thought, well, this has gotten a little uh, far down the line. So I called 911 and they asked me for my location and everything. And I was telling the operator, you know, you better, um, I don't know what's wrong with this person, but it looks like maybe a drug withdrawal or something like that. And then gradually the person started taking off all their clothes. And, you know, one by one, they were like buck naked out there and screaming and rubbing themselves on the uh, concrete, I, you know. And, uh, then very quickly, you know, one squad car pulled up and then another one. And finally, they had like about 20 policemen out there and they had all surrounded this person. And this was happening right across the street. And then the ambulance pulled up and they, you know, um, you know, they helped him put his clothes back on and he was escorted away in a uh, um, ambulance, you know, so evidently it was some kind of drug thing. But, you know, this is the nature of uh how people just get completely out to lunch. It happens by degrees. And uh, at a certain point, society doesn't actually know how to handle it. So I was surprised that the you know, NYPD sent out no less than about 20 officers. You know? So and it was interesting the way they did it. They all just made a circle around him. You know, there are men standing chest to chest, getting closer and closer to this guy. And eventually one of them puts his arms around him, you know, and they put some handcuffs on him. And then they bring the, the uh, medics in from the uh, ambulance and uh, I, you know, I couldn't hear what was going on, but uh, that's how it all wound up, you know. So uh, <clears throat> this is a nature of a life gone completely out of control. Such a person is out of their own control. Even if they want to, there's no way you can get them to uh, do something to help themselves. They have to be, there has to be an intervention, you know, some kind of medical, psychological team have to work on them to bring them back from the other side. And, you know, our major cities now have people in place who can do this kind of thing. And it it's necessary more and more. And this is what it looks like at the bottom of that tube as you, you know, uh, pranashyati. Pranashyati means destroyed. And of course, when a person dies like this, what happens to them next? They become an animal some kind or another they've uh, wasted their human life and then they have to go through so many births of uh, some kind of you know bow wow tweet tweet forms and then finally they come back to a human form and um, hopefully they don't blow it again yes Gaurav you have a question You're thank you so much uh, 
Maharaj, I, I like the psychology, uh, you know, the whole thing you mentioned. And uh, I was wondering, like, this uh, uh, verse, and, you know, the other verses, they talk about, like, lust, greed, you know, all that. And I'm wondering if the Bhagavad Gita has something to say about shame, you know, because shame is also related to lust. And, uh, you know, like, sometimes greed, you know. So, uh, you know, I was... Yeah, that, that was my question. You know, if, uh, mm-hmm. if the Bhagavad Gita or, you know, Bhagavatam, they mentioned like shame something. Well, I, I don't hear much about shame because generally when people, uh, as people become more and more dysfunctional, they don't no longer feel any shame for anything. But that can be uh, a big proportion of some people's breakdown. Sometimes people uh, break down so much into shame that they can't function at all, even though uh, from that's kind of a people who don't have that violent tendency, you know, and when they become more and more dysfunctional, instead of becoming violent and angry, they just become withdrawn and escape through usually drugs or something. And uh, uh, that's an aspect of it. But Basically, it's it's the same kind of thing that you have a functioning human being, and by degrees that functioning human being becomes debilitated. And why did they get debilitated? Because they uh, thought about enjoying the senses, and this is what's missing in modern religion. You know, um, most religions do not understand that sense gratification is itself the enemy. We understand that, you know, no one can live without sense gratification. But the question is, one needs to restrict it. And um, to restrict it, one has to replace it. Uh, The major forms of sense gratification, they have to be replaced with something else. And the only way to do that is by replacing it with a taste gradually developing for devotional service. Unless we get a taste for devotional service, we're going to remain like, um, you know, artificial renunciates, that we are renouncing the things of this world, but we really wish we weren't. And if you stay in that mentality, it's just a matter of time before you'll eventually give it up and go for it, you know. So that's not the solution. You know, Vishaya Vinavartan Te Haras Yudehina Rasul Varyam Rasopiasya Param Drishva Navartate. That by... Um, a person may be restricted for sense gratification, but the taste for sense objects remains. But ceasing such engagements uh, by experiencing a higher taste, one is fixed in consciousness. So through engaging in devotional service, we gradually get that higher taste. And we're not biting our nails and, uh, you know, wearing some straight jacket, uh, wishing that we could just go out and blow it out one afternoon. You know, uh, we're not thinking like that. We have come to the point where we, even if we had that opportunity, we wouldn't take it because we understand that uh, it's debilitating to our body and mind. And at the same time, we are satisfied with what's going on. And, you know, we're learning how to give up sense gratification uh, more and more and refocus on Krishna and to use our senses in the channel where we're not just um, getting more and more uh, dark in the kinds of things that we take satisfaction in. So that's what it's like. Let me, uh, at this point, just finish up what I had planned to uh, show in this um, slideshow, because I have one more thing to discuss, and that is, um, where is it? Oh, here we go. This is the um, chariot of the senses or the chariot of the body. We might have all heard or seen this analogy. It actually comes from the Katha Upanishad uh, 1.3.3 and 1.3.4. Atmanam ratinam vidhi sariram ratame vicha buddhim tu saratim vidhi mana. Pragraham Evacha. The individual is the passenger in the car of the material body, and the intelligence is the driver. 
Mind is a driving instrument, and the senses are the horses. So we've seen this uh, image before, or this uh, particular uh, painting, Indriyani Hayan Ahur Vishayams Teshu Gocharan Atmen Atmendriya Mano Yuktam Bhokteti Ahur Manishinaha. The self is just is thus the enjoyer or sufferer in association with the mind and senses. So it is understood by great thinkers. So this image of the man driving this chariot, the senses, as we were just talking about, by contemplating the objects of the senses. So we're talking about senses here. Those are the horses. There are five of them. You know, the taste, the visual sense, the audio sense, the smell sense, and the tactile sense. All these are our various five senses. And they're supposed to be controlled by the mind. And in this case, the uh, image describes the reins or the tethers that go to the horse's mouth as the mind. And then the person on the chariot, he is the intelligence or the driver. And the person in the back seat there, that's the soul. So the soul is not directly connected to anything. But he is along for the ride in this uh, chariot of the body. And as long as the uh, soul has made the effort to train the intelligence in Shastra, then the intelligence is directing the horses in the right direction. Otherwise, it's the horses that are calling the shots. And that's what makes this whole downward spiral so drastic and so dangerous is because we don't know where the horses are taking us. Are we focusing on the horse of vision? Or are we focusing on the horse of smell, the horse of taste, the horse of uh, hearing? Which horse are we focused on? And since the horses are not intelligent, they simply go after what attracts them. And it, was, it would be the same thing if you were driving a real chariot and the person who was driving wasn't directing the horses, rather letting the horses run wherever they want to go. Right away, you would see you would probably go in circles and you might even wind up going off the edge of a cliff, which is what's being depicted in this particular painting that the horses are about to step off the cliff. And uh, this particular uh, verse from the Katha Upanishad is quoted, I believe, in the uh, purport of 6th uh, chapter, 6th verse, which is uh, where uh, Prabhupada talks about um, this whole idea of, um, let's see if I can find it here. Bandhur Atmanas. Bandhu Atmana Manastas Ya Yenat Mai Vatmana Chittaha Anatmanas to Shatru De Vartenat Mai Vashatru. But for him who has conquered the mind, the mind is the best friend, but one who has failed to do so, the mind will remain the greatest enemy. So conquering the mind means working with the mind. Every day, you know, we are working with the mind to try to uh, push it in the right direction. We understand what our unfortunate tendencies are. We're trying to push it away from those. And we're trying to push the mind in the direction of accepting spiritual life, of using its mental faculties to think about how we can increase devotional service, how we can give Krishna consciousness to others. And this way, the mind is gradually being tamed. The mind is being controlled instead of the mind controlling us. Otherwise, the mind will just let the horses do whatever they want, and that is a prescription for disaster. Okay, so we're at the near end of our term. We'll see if there is anyone who has any questions, and if not, then we'll do a uh, quick wrap-up. Uh, uh, Kirtan. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Oh, Ken, how are you? Hi, Bo. Um, I just had a question. What is the distinction between ignorance and delusion? You know, yeah. um, 
I think of that verse where I think it's in the third chapter where it talks about how lust is what compels us to act almost by force. Um, and I think that's that's from ignorance because we're living on, on the, in the material uh, platform thinking that everything's for us. So, I mean, which, it's almost like a which comes first, the chicken or the egg. It seems like there has to be some kind of delusion to engage in lustful behavior, you know, um, to, to do something that we know is not really good for us, but yet we keep doing it almost as if by force. So is that <laughs> ignorance? Or is that delusion? I and mean, which, which is which? Well, I wouldn't say it's either one, you know. Um, actually, illusion and, uh, uh, and delusion or ignorance and delusion are pretty much very similar. They are uh, closely aligned. And, you know, I try sometimes to get devotees to recognize that um, sometimes these words are used interchangeably, and there's nothing particularly wrong with that. But sometimes these words are used in a more specific context where they mean uh, there's some nuance between them. You know, like generally when we are talking about both ignorance and delusion, ignorance is a more broad, general thing, which uh, uh, means just being unaware of certain important realities, whereas delusion means already substituting some false reality in place of it. And in some way that uh, delusion is uh, a... um, mistaken understanding of what the situation around us in our environment is. Now, often when in the context of Bhagavad Gita or some other scripture or some other um, purport of scripture, the word ignorance refers to basic ignorance, meaning not knowing that we are spirit soul in a material world and the material world is not our home and it's gradually causing us to suffer. This is basic ignorance, you know. Um, yeah, we may also not know how quantum physics works. We may not understand, you know, how to integrate uh, a third order differential or something like that. That's also a kind of ignorance, but that's not the ignorance we're talking about. We're talking about ignorance in the sense of um being unaware of the basic situation we're in, which is we're a spirit soul inside a body. Uh, We have karma and we have desires from the past and we need to purify those and get out and get out of the material world. Now, most people are possessed of that type of ignorance. And when you have that kind of ignorance, you don't have any motivation to walk around sense gratification. Why should you avoid sense gratification? It's right there. We know it'll feel good. At least it'll feel good in the initial issue. Uh, So why avoid it? There's no motivational or philosophical reason to turn the other way or to walk down the other side of the street. But if we do know that we're spirit souls, we know all around us are temptations to engage the senses. We know what's going to happen if we do engage them. This means that we're not in ignorance. Then we do have a motivation to think, well, maybe I should do this. Uh, Let me work to avoid doing this. And we begin to live a life that is structured around avoiding certain kinds of pitfalls that normally we would just walk right into. Is that uh, kind of explain it or not? Yes, thank you. Yeah, okay. All right. So, um, Atma, you're there still in yes. Serbia? <clears throat> and uh, yes, we, we should do a quick uh, Hari Bowl and, and uh, then after that you'll wrap it up. Is that kind of what the next part of the thing is? Uh, that's correct, Maharaj. Yes. Okay. All right. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Samin Iti Namine Namaste Sarasvate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nibhisesa Sunabadi Bhaschat Yadeshatarine Jaya Shri Krishna Chaitanya 
Prabhu Nityananda, Shri Advaita Gadadha, Shri Vasadi Gora, Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Rama, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Ram, Hare Ram. Ram Ram Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada. Nitai Gaur Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Hari Bo, Nitai Gaur Hari Bo. Tai go to Haribo, 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 me Tai go to Haribo. Jaya Radha Govinda, Radha Govinda, Radhe. Jaya Radha Govinda, Radha Govinda, Radhe. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada. Jaya Prabhupada, Jaya Prabhupada, 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 Jaya Prabhupada. I will miss you, Pad, Padam Sapadavadi Kacharyato, Tadasata Sri Sri Manas, Divine Grace, AC Bhakti Vedanta Sami Prabhupada Ki, Nanta Koti Vaishnavinda Ki, all glorious and some of the Votis. All glorious to some of the All glorious to some of the All glorious to Sri Sri Guru and Sri Go Ranga Hari Hari Bo. Take it away, Atmanivedan.